Und nun als letzter Redebeitrag und sicher ein weiterer Höhepunkt Janet Beal. Of course, I'd like to add my voice to those who have thanked the organizers and everyone involved with this conference. I'm sure if Murray Bookchin were alive and had been here, he would have offered the same heartfelt thanks and solidarity and support for what you're doing. As I've said before, Bookchin died a, a disappointed man. He didn't He didn't live to see the revolution that he had worked all his life to create. I thought when I was in Rojava, I thought often of how much he would have appreciated what was going on there, however indirectly influenced by his ideas, however inchoate he is, however inchoate it still is. Um, but he was a historian of revolutions and understood that sometimes it takes several generations for um, a, a thorough revolution to take place and that those who begin it don't always live to see its fulfillment. That thought gives me comfort and yet still, if you'll indulge me, let me say, Bookchen Presente. Now to my subject. For a few hundred years now, town meetings have been the local government of towns in northern New England, including the state of Vermont where I live. On the first Tuesday of March of every year, in all 240 or so Vermont towns, citizens come together at the local school. Okay, sorry. Citizens come together at a local school or other large meeting place to make decisions for their community. It's the last gasp of winter and a sure sign that spring will come is the annual flowering of grassroots democracy. In some important ways, the town meetings are like the communes of Rojava. They're face-to-face -face democratic assemblies. They take place At the most local level, in Vermont, the towns are mostly under 2,500 people in population, perhaps the equivalent of villages in Rojava. But they also differ. In Rojava, the commune assemblies also exist in city neighborhoods. In Vermont, they're only in the towns. City neighborhoods do not have assemblies except in the city of Burlington, where Murray Bookchin helped create them in the mid-1980s. In Rojava, the communes are the basis of the self-government and thus have sovereign power. They share power in a sense, but they share it horizontally with each other. In Vermont, the town meetings have sovereign power only for local matters, powers divided vertically among the towns, the state of Vermont, and the federal government in Washington. In Rojava, the communes meet frequently because they are the basis of the self-government. The town meetings in Vermont assemble only once a year, although they meet more often if they wish. In Rojava, you have several tiers of confederal councils through which these communal assemblies collectively self-govern over broader areas. In Vermont, the town meetings don't confederate, except in loose, non-governmental associations. In Rojava, citizen decisions made by citizens move upward from the communes to the, to the city, the region, and cantonal levels. In Vermont, Town decisions don't, although towns can make non-binding resolutions about national or international issues if they choose. Most famously, in 1982, more than 150 Vermont towns voted simultaneously 
in favor of a freeze on nuclear weapons testing. Those decisions were all non-binding. They had moral force, but no legal force. Nonetheless, their moral force was strong. It initiated a whole movement across the United States that culminated in a million strong demonstration against nuclear weapons in New York in June of 1982. We can trace these differences back to their origins. Roosevelt's communes are brand new. The town meetings are centuries old, older than the United States as a country. In Rojava, the communes and their confederations originated in Erdogan's democratic confederalism and consciously modeled themselves on that specific program. New England's town meetings date back to the first settlements of Massachusetts in the 17th century by Puritans from England. Notably, Ergelon was influenced by Bookchin, who had studied the town meetings closely and was inspired by them to create libertarian municipalism. In the 17th century, Europe was undergoing the Protestant Reformation. There were different kinds of Protestantism. Some groups demanded more reform than others. The Puritans version was very extreme. They rejected the validity of all ecclesiastical hierarchy to mediate between the congregation of believers and God. That was very radical at the time. The result was that Puritan congregations were autonomous religious bodies, claiming that they and only they could interpret scripture for themselves. Once they settled in New England in, after 1629, founding towns in the New World after, of course, expelling the Native Americans, it must be said, that religious autonomy extended into the civil world and became political autonomy. The God-worshipping congregation became the self-governing town meeting. They made regulations about their religious practices and they passed laws about their communities. In the years before the American Revolution, under English colonial rule, town meetings spread outside New England, as far south, believe it or not, as Charleston, South Carolina. And in the 1770s, they were the engines of revolutionary activity against British rule, especially the Boston town meeting. But after the United States gained independence, conservative forces carried out a counter-revolution against all institutions of popular power. They assured that in most places, town meetings were replaced by incorporated forms of municipal government in which urban wards elected city councilors and mayors. Only northern New England towns held on to their democratic assemblies. They continue to meet and we can make a few generalizations about them. They meet on the first Tuesday in March, starting in the early morning. A moderator runs the meeting. All adult citizens of a town may participate. The agenda consists of a variety of items to which citizens can contribute in advance. The agenda is announced 30 days before the meeting. There are often concrete items, like whether to repair a road, or buy a new fire truck. The most compelling item is the town budget, inevitably the subject of much discussion as how much a town spends on something in a given year reflects its priorities. A budget is a moral document. When the discussion of a particular item is finished, the citizens vote by a show of hands, then move on to the next one. They also elect town officers who oversee the execution of the decisions over the next year. The townspeople sit on hard metal folding chairs, as I saw people do in Rojava. <laughs> they become very uncomfortable, but they continue anyway, and the meeting usually lasts for three or four hours. They break for lunch. The townspeople have brought home cooked food. Now these features of town meeting 
are more or less the same as they were centuries ago. And historically, historians know what decisions were they made and what officers they elected because they're recorded in the minutes in the town records. And we have stories about town meeting that have passed into Vermont lore. They've been much admired. The American philosopher Henry David Thoreau called town meeting, quote, the true Congress, the most respectable one ever assembled in the United States, unquote. Boy, was he right. At other times, they have been mocked by mainstream politicians as the ditherings of uneducated rural dolts. Murray Bookchin argued that they are a rare instance of assembly democracy in the tradition of ancient Athens, a tradition that Rojava has recently joined. But from a social science perspective, we don't know very much about historical town meetings because no one really studied them. To know what happens in a town meeting, how the discussion runs, you have to be there in person because they all meet at the same time. You can't divide yourself into 240 people. So we don't know, for example, how many people attended, really. What proportion of the residents of a town actually came to a meeting? How many spoke? How many were silent? Did more of them speak when the meeting was small or when it was big? When it was crowded or sparse? How often did a given speaker speak? How many women participated? How many spoke? How many were silent? How has this changed over time? Did wealthier communities' town meetings run differently from poorer communities? What about mixed communities? Did the rich and educated speak more than the poor and less educated? Or that is, we didn't know these things until recently. In 1970, a political science professor at a Vermont university decided to study this very important subject. He had grown up in the town meetings and was frustrated that conventional political science didn't talk about them whenever it talked about democracy. It just talked about republics. Not one single book was dedicated to the subject. But in 1970, Frank Bryan, who was a friend of Murray Bookchin, I should say, uh, later, not at the time, had a good idea. He assigned his students, maybe 30 or so at a class, the task of going to the meetings. Each one would sit with a notebook and a grid and count the number of people there, identify gender, perhaps something about their social economic status. The students would write down what time the meeting started and ended. When someone spoke, the student would write on the grid, bald man with plaid shirt, or brown haired woman in green vest and note which item they spoke to, how many times, and for how long. By the end of the meeting, the student would have all this data, and I know it's very positivistic, but he would bring it back to Frank Bryan, who would put all the data together, data together and crunch the numbers, and come up with useful information. He did this from 1970 until 1998, and he published the results in a, in a book called Real Democracy, which I highly recommend to you. He filled in our knowledge. In 2004, on average, around 20% of the townspeople participated, which is a decent showing for a day-long meeting. On average, out of every 100 participants, 44 spoke. The most talkative 10% made up about half the total speech acts. Usually they spoke for a minute or two at a time. Some just state their opinion, and that's it. Others are more conversational, with dialogue, going back and forth. The smaller the number of people at the meeting, the more equally the speech was distributed among those present. Wealthier towns and poor towns, he found, don't differ much in meeting length or participation. Even back in the 18th century, the philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson had written that in town meetings in Concord, Massachusetts, quote, the rich give counsel, but the poor also, and moreover the just and the unjust, unquote. The same is true today, Brian found. Within a given community, class status doesn't make a difference in participation. Educated and affluent people don't dominate the public talk. Everyone has opinions. And participation goes up when there's a conflict. As for women, 
On average, between, oh, in that 30 year span, starting in 1970, they made up 46 of, pretend, of attendance, 46 percent of attendance at town meetings, which I'm, by the way, very glad it exceeds the 40 percent gender quota at Rojava. Uh, but they constituted only 36 percent of the citizens who spoke out and were responsible for only 28 percent of the acts of speech. They speak more in small town meetings than in larger ones. But over that 30 year span, women's participation increased. The second wave of feminism was just getting underway. And many women must have initially felt that political participation was a men's zone. But by 1998, they attended in greater numbers than at the beginning, and they were much more talkative. Still, at 46%, women's participation in the town meetings exceeds their participation in other parts of the government in the United States, from city councils to the state governments to the government in Washington, women's participation is much lower. The United States Senate is only 20% women. So women's participation in these town meetings documents the importance of assembly democracy for women and of women for assembly democracy. Now, as I said, towns had been meeting for centuries before Professor Bryan got this idea to record this kind of information. My hope is that Rojava does not wait that long to document its assemblies. What a grand project it would be for students at the Mesopotamian Academy in Kamishlo to document the participation in the Rojava communes. How useful that would be for the people of Rojava to know what's, to have this information about their society, to know what's going on, to see how it changes over time, and to be able to explain and, and defend their democratic self-government to outsiders who may not understand it. I realize all this has been very positivistic. I won't throw any more numbers at you. Beyond the numbers, the town meetings of northern New England provide important experiences that transcend culture. First of all, citizen assemblies are not only venues for political participation, they're also schools for political participation. For many people, speaking in public is difficult, even frightening. It's even more frightening in an assembly because your acts of speech are connected to action, to voting, to decision making, which affects how people will live in your community. It's a responsibility. It's even more nerve wracking for outgroups like women and minorities who may feel self-conscious by virtue of their identity. But in town meeting, you learn to build up the courage to speak because you have to. You learn not to be afraid to inadvertently say something trivial or foolish because everyone else does at one time or another. That gives people confidence too. And they develop skills, civic skills and leadership skills. A second experience. People in town meetings learn civility. You know, from afar, it's easy to criticize someone you disagree with from behind your computer over the internet, for example. You don't see the consequences of that. But in town meeting, you sit down with people you disagree with who are also your neighbors. On the internet, we can just skip the sites we don't agree with. But in town meeting, you have to sit and listen to your neighbors express their differing points of view. But you know, that leads to better information and better understanding. And you learn to express your disagreement in civil terms. As Frank Bryan points out, in town meeting, you learn forbearance. You learn not to insult them or let your contempt or intolerance show because that person is also your local dog catcher or emergency medical technician or the parent of your child's best friend at school. Who knows, you may modify your view or they may modify theirs after they listen to you. Or maybe you work out a way for both views to be accommodated. But whatever the outcome, that process is healthier for the community as a whole. It teaches civic cooperation and sociability and trust. And in the end, it makes for better decisions. I'm almost finished. Murray Bookchin, who grew up in New York City, was always fascinated by urban processes, by the way strangers are incorporated into community life, by the rich texture of close-knit neighborhoods as well as towns and villages. He savored sociable discourse among people who live in the same place, in local networks, clubs, guilds, popular societies, associations, and cafes, even in neighborhood streets. 
Such sociability, he thought, was the nucleus of freedom. It provided a refuge from the homogenizing bureaucratic forces of the state and capitalism and embodied the material, cultural, and spiritual means to resist. That's why he wanted to revive the Citizens' Assembly and multiply it so that they existed not just in the towns of New England, but in urban neighborhoods as well and outside New England. By proliferating assemblies, then coordinating them into confederations against the centralized state, he said, we can decentralize power into, into viable community groups. In most times of social upheaval, Bookchin wrote, quote, people have turned to assembly forms as a way of taking control of their destiny. Apparently, we have something at work here that has abiding reality. Something in the human spirit demands systems of government based on face-to-face -face decision making, a personalistic as well as a participatory politics. It is as though the need for community and communing emanates from the human spirit itself." Unquote. Thank you. <laughs>